Is our Keyforge introductory video. This is Tabletop Royale's Keyforge intro. Learn to play. Um, so thank you for joining us. This is this is for people who are new to the game, people who are interested in the game. Uh, oh this may also be people who are returning to the game. Lord Farquaad just subscribed. Uh, thank you so much. Hey, Mr. Streamers, can you play some Fork Knife, please? <laughs> Thanks, Kappa. We will not be playing Fork Knife tonight. Yes, we are a uh, a lock smelt stream <laughs> so yeah um what we're gonna do we are we are structuring this so that we can put it on youtube later if that makes sense to our regular viewers yeah so we might not answer every question in chat uh we are gonna have like a qa kind of thing at the end if anyone has any questions yeah we will take questions during games but not like a probably not like about the game player like why didn't you do this stuff kind of like that we're just right. gonna we're gonna go through the games. We're gonna to try to explain all the cards, um, yeah. how the game works as we play it. We have the starter decks uh, to, to start with, so very basic. Yeah. The second game will be AOA versus a Coda deck. They're a little more advanced. We got a little more going on. And then the third game is gonna be AOA versus a World's Collide deck. So we can show um, all the different mechanics, including Ward, Alpha, Omega, and Rage, um, and hopefully cover as many play bases as possible there is i think yeah. there is a jar goggle in the one of these decks somewhere so that there's gonna be a lot of yeah <laughs> a lot of things thank you code red for that twitch prime and um we made sure to include every faction in the decks that we selected tonight um so but uh, fans of mars saurians and starlines have to wait to the third game to get to that so um we do plan on taking a small just a small like editing kind of break uh, in between the games we have no idea what that's going to look like yet. Um, we're just kind of playing like, it by ear. I'm going to hit a so, button and then I will say, welcome to game two or yeah, something. I don't know. Right. So, um, but yeah, we'll just jump right into it. So, uh, like I said, this video, if you are curious about Keyforge, if you are new to the game and you want some extra info, that's why we're putting this together. Um, the new set of Keyforge uh, is coming out very, very soon, Mass Mutations. Um, and we wanted to basically get a really nice overview of the game, how the cards work, how you play them. Um, we're going to take it super slow. Um, as we go through, uh, the, the, these games, we're going to try to show off every card as we play it. Um, so at the very least in the first game, we will do that. Yeah. I don't know about the later games. Well, we'll see. Yeah. Um, so the object of the game of Keyforge, you are an Archon represented by the picture on the back of your deck and the name of the Archon is also on the back of your deck. The very top there. Uh, this is Radiant Argus the Supreme. Yep, and so for uh, for the first game, Justin's gonna be playing Radiant Argus. I am going to be playing Miss Onyx Sensorius. Um, the object of the game is to forge three keys. How do you yep. do that, you ask? Well, you generate these little things called Amber. Now, at the beginning of your turn, if you have six amber, you forge a key. As soon as you flip your third key over, you win the game. Yep. Simple as that. Yep. So it takes a minimum of three turns to win the game. Uh, barring other things, of course, we'll talk about that later. Uh, the way you generate amber, of course, is playing cards and using cards you have. Now, each archon comes with 12 cards of each of three different houses. So each deck is 36 cards. Uh, Radiant Argus is Logos Sanctum Untamed, as you can see by the bottom of the Archon card. Yep, and uh, Miss Onyx Sensorius is Brobnar, Dis, and Shadows, right there. Um, and uh, you'll see the other factions that are in the game. Currently there are nine factions. We're thinking um, the set that's gonna be after Mass Mutations may have new factions in them. Um, one of the enjoyable things about the game is the flavor, how it really feels like anything is possible in this game. Um, Brobnar, these giant barbarians who have mechanical limbs, um, they like to fight, they like to beat up um, people. They get their, um, they're, they're a, a faction that really rewards you 
uh, engaging with your opponent. Um, shadows are uh, a group of elf thieves, um, and they, for the most part, try to hide from the opponent and steal amber, generate amber um, through other methods. And finally, um, in this deck at least, we've got uh, the demons from Dis, and uh, these are like techno demons. They've got some crazy looking outfits, um, and uh, so they're typically sort of the protagonists in the setting. So, I'm gonna talk about the card types. So there are four types of cards in Keyforge. Not that much to keep track of, and they're all pretty self-explanatory. The first uh, we'll talk about is creatures, the most basic thing. You have creatures in most games. Um, they have power. A creature's power is also its health. So when a creature fights another creature, they both do damage to each other simultaneously, equal to the amount of power they have. Damage is persistent, so uh, one thing we will note about Keyforge is you do need a certain minimum number of tokens to really play the game. Um, if you're used to magic... Uh, dice encounters are, are going to be no stranger to you, especially if you play Pokemon. A lot of other card games use tokens. Um, Keyforge is no different than those. When you play a creature, it comes into play exhausted, um, and at the end of your turn, it readies. So you can't actually, and to use a creature, you have to turn it, you have to exhaust it. So you can't actually use a creature over the turn it comes into play unless you have other things that let you do that. Yeah. Uh, there are two basic actions that a creature can do it can either reap. Or it can fight. So if I wanted to reap with this creature, I would turn it sideways. And that is how you collect amber. That's one means of collecting amber. So I would say I want to reap with this Witch of the Eye. I would take an amber token and I'd add to my amber pool. And that's all it does. It's exhausted. The end of my turn is already. Next, my next turn, I could use it again potentially. Yep. You can also fight with it. So if I wanted to, for some reason, fight this Shuler, who is five power, with my three power Witch of the Eye, I could say, okay. Uh, which of the eyes is going to activate and fight? Turn it, I exhaust it. I say it fights Shuler. They both do damage simultaneously. Shuler will do five damage to this Witch of the Eye, killing it because it only has three health. I've added to my discard pile, and then Shuler gets three damage. Yep. If Shuler takes two more damage from any source, Shuler's going to die. Yep. Um, and then there are actions, which you just play from your hand. They go to your discard pile after their effects have resolved. So you just read the text. You do what it says. It says, deal one damage for each friendly creature in play. You may divide this damage among any number of creatures. So I count the number of friendly creatures I have in play. I then have that much damage to do to my opponent's creatures. Pretty simple. If they yep. have damage equal to their health, they go to the discard pile. A lot of actions in this game are going to have uh, amber icons on them, uh, shown right there. And that means that when you play that card, you get, that, you get to add an amber to your pool. Um, and you actually add that amber to your pool before you do anything else on the card. There are also attachments. Attachments play on two creatures. So I have to have a creature in play, or my opponent has to have a creature in play for me to play it onto the creature. Hey, someone gonna be like, oh, buy the first deck today, I don't know how to play with this deck. Well, that's what we're in the middle of explaining. You came to yep. the right place, so we're explaining the game. <laughs> so. You, play, you can play attachments onto creatures. Uh, for instance, this one you can see has an amber token. So if I played it onto my, let's say, Witch of the Eye, which I put somewhere, I would take it from hand, put it underneath the, the creature, and it is now considered attached to that creature. I'd add an amber for playing that card. And the text of this card says this creature gets plus one armor and gains taunt. Armor absorbs the first X amount of damage where X is the amount of armor the creature has. It takes on a turn. It refreshes at the end of the turn, so you get your armor back. And taunt means your opponent cannot attack its any creatures next to it without first attacking it, yeah. or without first removing it somehow. So if, if Witch of the Eye was in play, this headhunter would have to attack Witch of the Eye before it could attack this card, this Sergeant Zekiel. Yep. And finally, uh, there are artifacts. Artifacts have an effect usually an action that you would be able to do with them. Uh, they sit in play, kind of in a, a zone below your creatures, and they just do a thing. You exhaust them to do a thing. So Library of Babel, you exhaust it, and you draw a card from your deck. Pretty simple. Straightforward. Now, how do you play these cards? They all have a cost. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, bef before we get into the first game, I did want to cover reasons why we actually enjoy playing Keyforge. 
Um, so if you're if you're new to the game and you're looking for reasons to pick this game up versus the sea of other card games out there, um, the the first and foremost thing that you're going to get is a completely unique experience. No two people that have played Keyforge have the same experience with the game, and I think that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, I think if you come from other game, other competitive card games, you're gonna, uh, you will often, especially at like really high competitive levels, you're gonna see the same decks over and over again, and you're gonna play the same games over and over again, and um, you will feel like those games are scripted. If there's anything I can say about Keyforge. Is that the experience is far from scripted? Yes. You 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 when you sit down when you sit down in a sealed game, you have no idea what to expect. You might have an idea of how your deck is going to function, but you don't know where the game is going to take you. And we should say that if if you're not familiar with KeyForge as a concept, you buy a deck, it is assembled, it is generated randomly, and it is made to be completely unique. Yeah. It is not the same. You'll get a deck list um, on the Archon card. Uh, I don't even know if you can read this one, but uh, the, there will be a deck list on the Archon card that will show you all of the cards in the deck. And no other deck has that exact combination of cards. No, None in existence. This one does not count because it's the yeah, starter there, deck. There's an in. asterisk right here. So, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah there, there's just so much to, to discover with a game. Opening a new deck is one of the most fun experiences you can have opening and playing with it, oh, what can this deck do? And then as you're playing with it, you learn more about it. The more games you get on your belt with it, the better you get. The more you learn those little subtle plays, and that, I think, is the most rewarding part yeah. of the game. Yeah, and when you feel like you've truly mastered a deck, you can just go buy a new deck and start all over again. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I, I do uh, want to... Um, I'm, I'm, I've lost my point here. So I was reading uh, Roadrunner's comment, and uh, appreciate your appreciate your uh, positive comment there, Roadrunner. Um, yeah. So uh, there's a lot of people who I think who are veterans to card games that when they look at KeyForge, they see oh, there's a gimmick, and once you get past the gimmick or novelty phase, you realize how much strategy there is actually in the game, and uh, Top level decks squaring off against each other. Um, you, it's it's very similar to a chess game. Yeah, yeah, it, it can be very intense. Right, um, and uh, it's a lot of fun, and it's something that I think people who have that really competitive drive can can fully appreciate um, when they sit down and, and find themselves in that situation. I do want to so. go over how how the, a turn goes. Yeah, because yeah, we didn't yeah. talk about that, but but I did want to get all that out of the way for the people who aren't interested in learning the gameplay until they've been sold on the game. Okay. So. The game is now sold to you. Here's yeah. how you play. Now that you're ready to now that you're ready to buy the game. Here so we you go. You shuffle up your deck. The hand size is six cards. The player who goes first, however, will draw seven cards on their first turn. Uh, before we start, I'm just gonna explain how the turn works. So I'll take seven cards. I'll look at my hand. So on my turn I will name one of my three houses. I can always reference my houses on an Archon card here, Logo Sanctum or Untamed. Um, during your turn, you may play or use cards from the active house. So on my turn, I would say Untamed, because I basically I, just, I want to play as much stuff as I can right now. I have nothing on the board. I just want to get as much stuff in play as I possibly can. So I look at my hand, I see three total Untamed cards. I want to play all those cards. So I would play Untamed. Uh, I have two Niffleapes I can play. I'll show you what a Niffleape looks like. He ignores Taunt and Elusive, and Elusive we'll talk about in a little bit. Probably we'll get an Elusive creature on the table. Basically, which means you have to attack it twice to be able to kill it. Um, so I'd play a Niffleape. It would come into play Exhaust, so I'd play another one. You can only play creatures on either of your flanks, which means at the end of your battle line. All creatures exist on a battle line. You can't stack them yep. or anything. Sometimes things get a little clogged here, but... For the, for the most part, creatures need to exist in one singular line on the board. Yeah. And then I will play this Cooperative Hunting, which is, we showed it earlier, deal a damage for each friendly creature in play. So I could do two total damage, I could do one to this urchin, and I could put a damage onto this smash, killing the urchin. He could also kill the Dust Imp if he wanted to, but uh, as you'll see, you, killing Dust Imps is not always a great idea. Um, as you can see, I have the, have the phases of the turn up there, so we just went through the play and use card step. 
At the end of that, there's the ready cards step. So these Niflapes would ready. And then I would draw cards. So during the draw card step, you say how many cards do I have in my hand and you draw up to six. So I have three cards. So I would draw three cards from my deck to go back to six and my turn's over. And pass back to the opponent. They would then, if they forge, if they have enough Amber to Forge key, they'd forge, they'd choose a house and they'd proceed to play cards. Yep. So we can jump into it now. Yep, we'll, we'll dive right into a game because uh, honestly, I think watching the game, playing, getting, getting your hands on the cards are, is the best way to learn the game. So. Yep. Just give it a quick shuffle. Uh, I should note that these decks right here are the exception to the rule of no two decks are the same. Um, in the very first starter set, they printed uh, learn to play decks um, that were not tournament legal and actually include earlier versions of the cards. So some of the cards that exist in these decks don't actually read the way they do in print in the wild. Um, so things so, might look, look a little different between this game and future games. Yeah. And, or if you stumble across Anger or Full Moon from in your decks and wonder why they don't look like the cards in these decks, that's why. So we shuffled our decks. We each drew our starting hands of six cards. Now the first player is going to draw seven cards. We'll determine that randomly. By yeah. rolling two dice and taking the higher number, and hoping we don't roll in the same number a bunch of times like yep. we should do. And uh, the YouTube the YouTube video stays uh, is four hours long of us rolling dice and right. our learn to play keyforge. It didn't happen. I rolled higher. Uh, when you randomly determine who the first player is, it's not a choice. Like in a lot of card games, it's not a choice of who the first player is. The the, the random determination just that is the first player. So I am first player. My starting hand is seven cards. So yep. I pick up my hand and look. Yep, my starting hand is six cards. Now you do get an opportunity to mulligan uh, for the purposes of of the intro stream. We will not mulligan. Yeah, we'll just take our time. hands and we'll roll with it. Yep. If you are not familiar with the concept of a mulligan from other games, um, that's fine. We'll probably uh, go over mulligans in our second game. It's essentially just shuffling your hand back and drawing a new hand of one less card. All right, so I'm looking at my hand and on my first turn I can only play one card, but I do have to call a house, so... I will call House Sanctum. Now I can play one card from House Sanctum from my hand. I'm going to play Champion Anaphil. Now he's a big six power, one armor creature with taunt. He sits on the board and he, he's going to protect future guys that I play next to him. Yep. So I play him, then on my turn. You have, no other, you have no other units on your battle line, so he just comes down automatically on a flank, showing up for the first time um, and just kind of sits there. And then it passes to Nathan. All right. So for uh, my turn, I am going to say Brobnar, personally my favorite house in the game. Uh, I am going to play Smash. Smash is a five power creature that has a play effect. And the way play effects work, when you play that creature, you get that effect. And it says stun a creature. So place a stun status card on that creature. We don't have status cards. We do have tokens. Yep. So um, a stun token means the next time this creature is used or activated in any way, you remove, you tap the creature and remove the stun token and it gets no other effect. Um, so I have essentially stopped Champion Anaphiel from attacking next turn or reaping uh, the next time he's used. And then I am going to play Headhunter, who is a uh, another five power Brobnar creature with a fight effect of gain one Amber. Now a fight effect happens after this creature has fought another creature and has lived. So if Headhunter, on the next chance I get to use it, if Headhunter attacks Champion Anaphil, um, Headhunter does not kill Champion Anaphil because of the power difference in the armor, um, I, I do not gain this fight effect. However, if Headhunter fights one of Justin's smaller creatures, like a Niffle Ape or a Witch of the Eye, which are three power, after the fight is over, I would gain an amber, placing it into my amber pool. So, uh, though that is the two cards that I can play. Um, I am done, so I ready my creatures, and I draw two cards to go back up to six. Okay, so, my turn. I don't forge a key. Got no amber. I will say untamed. Uh, I'm going to play a full moon. So this card has amber pip on it, so that's the first thing I do is take an amber from the supply and add it to my pool. 
It says, for the remainder of the turn, gain one amber each time you play a creature. Pretty powerful card. I will note that this card in future printings does not have that amber pip on it. Yeah. They probably realized that was a little too powerful. Yep. And that goes to my discard pile. I will play a Niffle Ape. I was going to play Exhausted. I get an amber because the full moon effect is persistent throughout my turn. Showed Niffle Ape earlier. I'm going to play a Snuffle Gator on this side. Show Snuffle Gator. He's four power. Uh, he has Skirmish. So when he fights, he does not get damaged back. Pretty useful. He's very efficient at fighting and he does four damage, which can kill a lot of stuff. And we have a really cool Snuffle Gator emote <laughs> in our chat if you're a subscriber. Yeah. Snuffle Gator was our, uh, our channel's first kind of mascot. So very cool. And I do get an Amber for playing that. And then I will play a Dust Pixie, which is a very, very efficient creature. It gets two Amber when you play it. It only has one power, but it gets most of its efficiency just from coming into play. So I get two Ambers from playing it, and then I get another one for the full moon. Pretty good. I got three Amber for playing that one creature. That is a large percentage of the way to me winning the game. So, pretty cool. And then I can sit and play another turn in case I need to use it for something else. I can't use this champion in Apple this turn uh, because that is not of the active house. Yep, you did not choose Sanctum. You can't use it. That's a, that's a mistake that's hard to get around for people who come from other card games, is usually you can use everything that's on your board. You can only use things or that are of the active house, no matter what, unless there's a card that says differently, which there are a few, but they're they're rare. They're, they're tough. They're, they're not in every single deck. So I can't touch this champion in Ethel. I won't even be able to remove the stun token until the next time I call House Sanctum. So it could be a while before he does anything except sit there. Yep. Which he's actually useful sitting there because of his time. And that's the end of my turn. Ready, Mall, I guess. All right. I draw four cards up to six, three, four. And I have six Amber on my pool, so I will tell Nathan that he's in check. And check means that I, at the beginning of my next turn, I will forge a key. Yep. If he does not do anything to stop it. Yep. So, um, start of my turn, I have no Amber. I don't forge a key. Uh, I am going to choose House Dis for this turn. Um, House Disc does give me an opportunity to stop just, uh, Justin's uh, check here. Um, the one of strategically forging a key in this game is a is a good marker because it's very rare that you can do anything about your opponent's forged keys. Amber gets traded back and forth between players throughout a game. However, when, once a key is forged. It's very unlikely to be unforged. Um, it's kind of like a checkpoint in the game that you're hitting quick save. <laughs> so if I can stop this key, that means Justin's going to have to add, uh, go through some more work on future turns um, to, to, to try to forge. So, All right, so I'm going to say House Dis, and we'll start things off with Schuler, who is a five-power demon, and... Schuler says, play, if your opponent has four amber or more, steal one. And uh, there's a, a bit of a reminder text on the card that says, stolen amber is taken from your opponent's pool and added to your own. So I am going to play Schuler. Justin has six, so I get to steal one from him. And then I am going to play a Stealer of Souls. I'm not content with just stealing Amber. I am ready to move on to Souls. And the Stealer here says, after an enemy creature is destroyed fighting Stealer of Souls, purge that creature and gain one Amber. Um, purging is a mechanic that removes the card from the game. And so, uh, and this is not a fight effect. So if Justin were to attack Niffle Ape into my Stealer of Souls, the Stealer of Souls effect would still work. Now, Stealer of Souls does have to actually survive the combat for his effect to work, but um, his effect works even if Justin fights into me. So normally when a creature dies, it goes to the discard pile, and then when your deck, your draw deck runs out, you shuffle your discard pile into your deck, form a new draw deck, and keep playing the game. Yeah. If a card's purged, it's never coming back. That game is gone. Yep. 
uh, asterisk. Asterisk. Because there there's are asterisks to everything. We there, say. There, everything we say, there's an asterisk to this <laughs> game. So, and then I am going to play Toxin, who is a three power demon that says reap. Your opponent discards a random card from their hand. So if I get to activate Toxin and I reap with him on the next turn, not only do I get an amber, I get his reap effect of discarding a card at random from Justin's hand. So, which is very powerful. Um, yes, yeah, extremely powerful. All right. That is my turn. I didn't generate a lot of amber that turn, but I did stop Justin from forging, and I've developed the board some more. So I will now draw three cards up to six, uh, four, five, and six. Okay, so my turn starts. I don't forge. I only have five amber. I need six. So I will look at the cards available to me. I, I see that I have three untamed creatures that are already on the board. That's a lot of usage I can get on the board. Those guys can fight, they can reap, they can give me amber, they can do all kinds of stuff. So I also have two untamed cards in my hand that I can play. So I think that's so that's too much value to just ignore. So I'm gonna call untamed for the turn. I will play a hunting witch. Oh, on my left flank, another very powerful card. It says every time you play another creature, gain one. Okay, it sits in the board. If Nathan can't deal with it, it's gonna give me a lot of amber probably. And I will put it next to my champion and now feel because he is taunty. And that makes it even harder for Nathan to fight. Can't fight it directly. I've got to find some other way to get to the Hunting Witch. And then I'll play another Snuffle Gator. Fan favorite, Snuffle Gator. So I get an Amber for playing the Snuffle Gator because of the Hunting Witch. And now I have three creatures I can use. Now I could have played cards and used cards in any order I want. Uh, there's no, you don't have to play all things and then fight all things at once. You don't have to do that. Every action you can take can be in different sequences, which you can get really, really creative uh, down the line with, with more complex cards and board states. So Snuffle Gator, he's an obvious choice to fight something. I really don't like this Toxin on the board. He's pretty scary. If he reaps, he's going to start hurting my hand. So Snuffle Gator will exhaust to fight the Toxin. He has Skirmish, so he doesn't take any damage back, but he does four damage to the Toxin. Toxin dies, goes to the discard pile. Uh, Niflape can't constructively fight anything. If he fights anything, he dies and doesn't kill them. So I'll just use Niflape to reap. I'll exhaust him, gain the Amber. Dust Pixie, same basic thing. It's only one power, so... I will use Dust Pixie to reap and gain an Amber. And that is my turn. So I will ready my cards. I will count the number of cards in my hand. I have four. I will draw up to six. Okay. And I will say check again. I have eight Amber currently. All right. Um, I have one Amber. I do not forge a key. I uh, am far, far away from forging a key right now. I actually strategically have a choice to make. I've got two of each of the, the my current houses on the table, and I have two of each of those cards in my hand. So I kind of have to pick which one of these houses I want to go with this turn. I honestly think that uh, this is my best bet for the turn. Uh, an argument could be made for Brobnar. Um, but uh, I will say this, and I am going to play an action called Hand of Dis. And this says, destroy a creature that is not on a flank. Um, so I cannot destroy Snuffle Gator, and I cannot destroy Dust Pixie, but I could destroy any of the other creatures. Um, I'm going to choose to Hand of Dis, the champion in Aphiel. Now, uh, that's going to get a taunt creature out of my way, and that's going to let me fight more effectively with the creatures that I have on the table. Um, I am going to play a Dust Imp. We saw him from the brief preview um, before the game started. He has a two power imp that says destroyed gain to Amber. So if I find a way to get him killed, I'll actually get, gain a bunch of Amber. Um, if Justin kills my Dust Imp during Justin's turn, I gain the Amber. All right. now. Uh, I have no further cards from my hand that I'm going to play. I am going to use my creatures that are on the table. I'm going to use Stealer of Souls to fight the Hunting Witch. Um, Hunting Witch is going to deal two damage back to the Stealer of Souls. Um, but uh, the Stealer of Souls is going to purge the Hunting Witch. And I also gain an Amber. Now, the reason I'm fighting here is strategically Justin on his next turn could have just reaped with all five of his creatures and gone into check again. Um, I can't stop Justin's 
uh, key this turn. So the best thing I can do is force Justin to do something else with his turns. Um, a lot of players will, um, especially when you're new to the game, are going to uh, try to just fight the other creatures off the table, and that's oftentimes going to be a mistake. But in this situation, I kind of need to do that so that I can um, uh, basically slow down Justin's advance. Now, I'm going to take Schuler, and Schuler is actually going to fight Snufflegator, and I'm sorry to do that to you, Snufflegator. Um, I, we love you around here on this channel, but uh, Snufflegator presents a threat. So, Schuler is going to take out Snufflegator, and that is going to be my turn. Um, I didn't generate as much amber as I wanted to that turn, but I at least cut down on the amount of stuff that Justin can do on the table. I did want to point out, when uh, Honey Witch was purged, I put it underneath my Archon card. It's just another out-of-play zone that you can use for purging. Uh, in tournament play, they rec recommend you use this zone for purging so you don't accidentally shuffle it back in later, and it's, yeah. it's easy to grab after you finish playing the game instead of putting it off to the side or something and forgetting about it. So yep. it's just going to hang out in a Markov card until or in my um, Archon card after the game. Yep, so I'm going to uh, draw two cards real quick, and I am finished. It is back to Justin's turn. All right, so step one, forge a key. I count six amber, one, two, three. Four, five, six. Put it back in the pool, and I flip my first key. I have now successfully forged one key and one third of the way to winning the game. Yay! Cool. All right, I will. I think still stay untamed this turn. I have three dudes on the board, and I have one I can play from my hand. So I'm going to play Devil Queen. Each other friendly beast gets plus one power, and each other friendly Nifl creature gets plus one power. So. Uh, up under the name there are the traits on a card. Um, that's why Justin and I have been calling attention to those traits um, because there are cards in the game that care about those traits. Um, so this Niffle Ape is now larger. Snuffle Gator gets a boost. Dust Pixie does not get a boost. So right now Niffle Ape is 5 power and Snuffle Gator is 5 power as well. Niffle Because uh, Niffle Ape is a beast and a Niffle, so it's getting both bonuses from the Niffle Queen. Snuffle Gator is just a beast, so it's getting plus one power. And those are static effects. If Niffle Queen goes away, those go away immediately. So, I will use Snuffle Gator to fight the Stealer of Souls. Okay. It's a skirmish, um, it just dies. Yep. And uh, the Stealer of Souls is punished for his uh, avarice <laughs> by the Snuffle Gator. Um, Niffle Ape is five power. I think it's probably worth it for me to attack the headhunter here. So since they're both 500, they both die. Or both 5 power, they both die. Because I don't want the headhunter killing my low power guys and getting Nathan free amber in the process. And then my dust pixie, I could attack that shuler, but I think I'm probably better off just using it to reap here. Uh, yeah, taunt means that if, if the creature's neighbor has taunt you could attack that creature so like if both of these guys had taunt you could attack either of those it's not saying that attack a taunt creature could attack a creature behind a taunt creature it is kind of a confusing wording though all right and then i have five cards in my hand so i draw one all right i am going to say brobnar i am going to play a gauntlet of command which is an artifact um, this turn is not going to get to do anything, but uh, on future Brobnar turns, I can take the action on the other effect that says, ready and fight with a friendly creature. Um, and the reminder text there says, the creature may be from any house. So this is actually a way to get around the rule of not being able to use creatures from other houses, unless um, you've got something that breaks that rule, basically. So... I am going to play Valdir, and um, Valdir is a six power giant that says Valdir deals plus two damage while attacking an enemy creature on the flank. So I am going to play Valdir on a flank. I am going to play a Brobnar card called War Song, and it says for the remainder of the turn, I gain one amber each time a friendly creature fights. So uh, I play this action, it goes to my discard pile, um, and I will get an amber whenever I choose to fight with uh, Smash here. Now, I am going to play another Brobnar card called Anger. It says ready and fight with a friendly creature. Same kind of thing as Gauntlet of Command, the upside being that it actually works this turn as opposed to me having to wait for this to work. 
Um, now the actual version of Anger does have an Amber Pip on it. Um, so once again, this is another one of those cards that uh, uh, doesn't actually look this way out in the wild. So I am going to play Anger and uh, I am going to ready and fight with a friendly creature. I am actually going to choose Valdir here because Valdir is big enough to take on the Niffle Queen. Now, uh, Valdir readies and fights. We've got six power plus two damage from Valdir's ability versus the Niffle Queen's six power. So Valdir um, and the Niffle Queen are both going to die. Now, I gain an amber each time a friendly creature fights. So I will gain an amber from the War Song with Valdir. Um, now, Smash, I could reap with Smash and I would gain an amber. Or I can fight with Smash and gain an Amber because of a War Song. So Smash is going to go Smash Snufflegator. And I know I look like a liar saying that it hurts me to beat up on Snufflegator and then fight all of the Snufflegators that were on the table off the board. But um, I, I'm sorry, Snufflegator. That's all I got. Yeah, anytime friendly creature is referenced, it's any friendly creature on the table, even if it's not at the active. Correct. Yeah. Which is really cool for a lot of reasons. I, I could have chosen the Shuler with my Anger to fight the, the Niffle Queen. It wouldn't die. I could have used Anger on my Dust Imp and have the Dust Imp fight the Niffle Queen. And I would actually gain two Amber from the Dust Imp dying. So that is um, totally possible there. Um, so if a card does not specify a house, um, you get to use whatever... Um, you you have in play whatever you can use so okay like I inch ever closer to forging a key I am at four I'm not at check yet but I do get to draw four cards and tell Justin to go ahead all right so I will say house sanctum for my turn um, I'm gonna play a protect the weak which I talked about earlier onto this dust, dust pixie it's an upgrade it gives him plus one armor and taunt and I get an amber for playing it because it's got an amber on the card Pretty basic. The Dust Pixie is not a great tar taunt target, but it makes him like slightly beefier, so he doesn't die to random damage. Yeah, and he could he could maybe throw some attacks off for Nathan. In uh, the does that deck have regrowth in it? It does, I think. Okay. Another reason to taunt the Dust Pixie is because an action in that deck lets you return a card from your discard, uh, a creature card from your discard pile to your hand. So by giving the Dust Pixie taunt, that forces me to kill it if I want to attack any of its neighbors. Um, that's one of those uh, things you learn about Keyforge is there's a lot of like things that are seem counterintuitive, but once you play a deck enough times, you'll start formulating the strategies as you go along. And then I'm going to play Cleansing Wave. So Cleansing Wave says, heal one damage from each creature, gain one amber for each creature healed this way. So it's going to heal one from Smash and Shuler, two total damage. And when you heal something, you just take a damage off it, put it back in the pool, and then I'm going to gain two amber because two creatures were healed. With that card, it's an action, so it goes. My discard pile, that is my turn. I draw up to six, and I pass turn and say check because I have six amber. All right, um, so I have four amber. I'm not forging a key. I am going to choose shadows as my house for the turn, and uh, I am going to play an artifact called Seeker Needle. Now, the first, I don't know, 50 games or so, Justin and I played this game. We did not realize this card was an artifact. We played it as if it were an action. We thought it were, was not a great card, but this is an artifact that sits on the table, and it lets you do one damage to a creature, and if that single damage is what causes that creature to die, you gain an amber. So I'm going to play a Seeker Needle down here. I am going to play a Shadows creature called Shadow Self. And um, Shadow Self is a big nine power specter. However, it deals no damage when fighting. So that means Justin can fight into my Shadow Self without taking nine damage back. And Shadow Self says damage dealt to non specter neighbors is dealt to Shadow Self instead. So Shadow Self takes the damage from my other creatures. So I'm actually going to play it next to the Shuler so that I could fight with it. Uh, strategically, I wouldn't want to put my Shadow Self next to my Dust Imp because I want my Dust Imp to die to get this Amber. Um, so Shuler is a big creature. I can get some extra mileage out of it fighting a couple of times um, and letting the Shadow Self take the damage instead of Shuler. Now I am going to play another Shadow creature called Naughty the Thief. Naughty is a two power elf thief that's elusive. 
Um, Elusive says the first time this creature is attacked each turn, no damage is dealt. So um, that could be a little bit more clear. What it means to say is that no combat damage is dealt. Specifically, when Justin and I compare the power of the creatures against each other and we take damage during that step, that is what Naughty the Thief ignores the first time it's fought for a turn. If there are other things that deal damage, um, other effects that deal damage before or during a fight, those would occur. Um, and I, I give you that lawyerly response right now um, because it matters. Uh, it's a minor, I guess, uh, it, there's some nuance there, um, but I'm trying to be clear about that. Anyway, Naughty also has an action that says, steal one amber. So as long as Naughty's on the table, instead of reaping with him, I can just activate him, exhaust him, and take one amber from Justin. So I'm going to play Naughty the Thief next to the Shadow Self. Um, Naughty the Thief is a priority target because he's very good at taking Amber from the opponent. So the Shadow Self um, is going to protect Naughty the Thief for me. Now finally, I'm going to play another Shadow's creature called Urchin. Urchin also has Elusive. And Urchin has a play effect of Steal 1 Amber. It's one power creature. Um, and, you know, Elf Thief, not very powerful. However, when you play it, I just get to take an Amber from Justin. So that's actually stopped Justin from forging the key there. Um, taking him off check. Uh, I don't have anything else I can do on my turn. I'm actually going to call it there. Um, I will untap my cards and then I will draw four. And I will tell Justin to go ahead. Okay. Uh, I am going to call Logos for the first time in the game. Uh, I'm going to play a Library of Babel, which we saw earlier, but says action, draw a card. Pretty cool. Use on future turns. I don't know if we went over this uh, clearly, but artifacts also come into play exhausted. Uh, I'm going to play one of my favorite cards in the game, Wild Wormhole. When you play it, you get an amber, take an amber to the pool. It says play, play the top card of your deck. So I play this action, and I get to play the top card of my deck just for free. It doesn't matter what house it is, it just plays. So I turn it over. It's a Hallowed Blaster. <laughs> One of my least favorite cards in this game. <laughs> it's an artifact with the action to heal three damage from a creature. Not super exciting. But yeah. um, he does actually get to put it into play during his Logos turn. So if Justin were to say Sanctum on his next turn, it's going to be ready for him to use then. Which so. is pretty nice. Um, and that, I think, is another uh, small encapsulation of what makes Keyforge great. Wild Wormhole is a card of infinite possibilities. It could have given Justin the best card in that deck. It could have given Justin the worst card in the deck, and it did. So, <laughs> I'm going to play Dr. Escatera. It says, play, gain one amber for each forged key your opponent has. So, no. Nathan has none. I don't yeah. get any amber for So, it. I have strategically not forged any keys in this game so that I could play around Justin's card right here. And then not because I have not had the opportunity to generate any more amber. And then I'm going to play Eo the Adventurer. Has skirmish and has fight draw card. So whenever it fights something, if it survives the fight, which it probably will because of the skirmish, I get to draw a card. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Pretty neat. It's a human scientist. Cyborg. Fun fact. Uh, the art for this is modeled after the one of the designers of the game, Brad Andres. That's pretty cool. Uh, and then I will play Twin Bolt Emission. Another one of my favorite cards. I get an amber for playing it. And I get to do two damage to two creatures. Now I can choose my own creatures. Sometimes you want to do that. For instance, if I had Dust Imp in play, I might kill my own Dust Imp. But I don't want to kill Nathan's Dust Imp because I don't want to give him two Amber because he'd forge a key. It would let me forge. So, I will do two damage to the Smash. Okay. Um, now, I could I have two more damage to do. I could do two damage to Urchin, which would kill it. I would normally kill Shuler with two damage, but Shadow Self is there absorbing the two damage so yeah it doesn't really even do anything the damage would be assigned here and the shadow self would take the damage and so i'm just going to try to get stuff off the table since nathan has secret needle in play if i take urchin out that basically removes one extra potential amber for him not to mention the amber from reaping so i'm going to go ahead and do two damage to urchin two damage to okay. smash to kill them the two damage comes into play in each of these creatures uh the card resolves these creatures have more damage on them than they can take uh to survive and so they will die and go to the discard pile and that is the end of my turn. I ready my cards. I have one card in my hand, so I draw up to six. Okay.
All right. Uh, Justin does have check. He's got seven amber. I am going to say shadows. Um, my shadows has finally come online. I am going to play nerve blast. Nerve blast says steal one amber. If you do, deal two damage to a creature. Um, I will call attention to the if you do clause here. There are several cards that have that clause on there, which means the stealing one is a prerequisite. If Justin had no amber and I couldn't steal, I couldn't do the two damage there. So uh, I'm going to steal an amber and I'm going to get to do two damage. Uh, I think I'm actually going to direct this two damage to Keo. Um, this will let me use the Seeker Needle to deal one damage to a creature, and if this damage destroys that creature, gain one amber. So I will shoot uh, Keo there, and that's going to give me an amber um, because he's finished off. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. sorry, sorry, yeah. Um, and I will play another copy of Nerve Blast. So I'm going to steal another one from Justin. And I get to do two damage. Um, I think... So I could actually shoot my own Dust Imp here to kill it to gain two more Amber. Um, I am not convinced that is necessarily the correct play. Um, but just to show off the variety of plays you could make in the game, I, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to assign two damage to my own Dust Imp, which is going to kill it, which is going to give me two more Amber. All right, now, um, I have two Shadows creatures in play that I can use. I'm actually going to use Nani's action to steal one from Justin. Um, I have decided that the best way to make Amber in this game is to simply take it from Justin as he generates it. And my Shadow Self here, I could uh, fight with it, however, it's not going to do any damage, so that's not very productive. I will simply choose to reap with the Shadow Self putting me to 12. So I will say check with 12. I will untap my shadows creatures and I will draw two cards. Okay. I'll tell Justin to go ahead. 12 amber is a lot of amber there. Uh, you drain it quite fast. So now you can see how Nathan sort of is coming back in this game. Yep. It can be, this game can be very swingy, which is another thing I, very, I like about it. It takes a little bit of getting used to because it does feel like whiplash, right? Yep. Justin Justin was very, very far ahead right there, but in one quick flurry of cards, I feel like I've turned the game around. I feel like Justin is now on his back foot um, where I was playing defensively beforehand. All right, so I will call Untamed for the turn. Um, my Dust Pixie will exhaust two Reap. I'm going to play Earl Pal Nifilate. Um, our old pal that we showed off a little bit earlier, Witch of the Eye. Very good card, three power. After she reaps, you can return a card from your discard pile to your hand. That's a good effect. If you have you ever played a card game before, recurring cards from the discard pile is super good. It's usually a pretty good effect. So if I'm able to activate her, she's going to do some powerful stuff. Yeah, um, she can get back... Uh, she can't get back the Hunting Witch. I did purge that, which is pretty good. But you could even choose to activate your Dust Pixie first and fight your Dust Pixie into someone, reap with Witch of the Eye to get the Dust Pixie back, play it, and you would generate two Amber, which would be more than you just reaping with the Dust Pixie for the turn. And I'm going to play Lost in the Woods. Another one of the best cards in the game. I get an Amber for playing it. Choose two friendly creatures and two enemy creatures. Shuffle each chosen creature into its owner's deck. So it's removal, and it lets me sort of set my deck up for future turns too, which is awesome. I got I messed up the green screen. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, so for my own creatures, I'm going to choose this Dust Pixie and this Doctor Escatera. Since this attachment is not attached anymore, it's going to go to my discard pile. I'm shuffling these two in because Escatera is going to definitely get me one next time I play her because Nathan's about to forge a key, and Dust Pixie I want to draw back into it so I can play it again so I can get two more Amber. And then on Nathan's side of the board, I'm going to shuffle that Naughty the Thief into the deck and the Shadow Self in the deck. I didn't want to shuffle Schuler back in because that Nathan gives Nathan another source of being able to steal Amber from me, and that's never fun. Another easy source, at least. So we're just going to shuffle our decks. Always offer your deck to the opponent to cut is a courtesy thing, uh, and is also important in tournament play. Not that I suspect Nathan of cheating, but... You never know. <laughs> and then my turn's over. Ready my cards. I have three cards in my hand. I will draw three. 
All right. And now, uh, we'll say check with six. Um, so I have 12 amber, which means I get to forge one key. Um, you can only forge one key a turn. So even though I have enough to forge two keys here, I can still only forge one key. So uh, I will spend the six and uh, flip it, and that amber is gone. All right. Now, uh, which of the eye is a problem? Niffle ape is not so much of a problem. Um, I am going to say I think this for this turn um, because I can stop Justin by saying this um, and I can also deal with uh, some of the uh, creatures that he's got on the table. So I am going to play Fear, which is an action that says play, return an enemy creature to its owner's hand. So I'm going to use Fear to bounce the Witch of the Eye. And then I'm going to play a card called Mind Barb. And Mind Barb says, your opponent discards a random card from their hand. Um, so Justin is going to shuffle his hand, and I'm going to get to discard a random card from it. I could have played Mind Barb before I played Witch of the Eye, um, but in this case, I don't particularly like Witch of the Eye, so if I can discard it, great. Um, discarding Sergeant Zekiel here is fine. Um, I got a Sanctum card. I think Justin's very likely to say Sanctum on the next turn because he's bounced kind of back and forth between Untamed and Logos for a couple of turns. Um, I am going to play Charette. Um, Charette is a uh, four power demon. It says play Capture 3. Capture is a mechanic we have not seen yet. It says Captured Amber is taken from the opponent's pool and is placed on this creature. And if this creature leaves play, return the Amber to the opponent's pool. So I have not destroyed the amber, however, I have captured it. Um, mechanically and thematically, I think this uh, is pretty straightforward. Now, if this creature leaves play for any reason, Justin could fight it. Um, Justin could use fear on it and bounce it. Justin um, could also purge it. Any, for any reason, if this creature leaves play, Justin gets this amber back. All right, I am... Um, I could reap with Schuler. I could fight Niffle Ape. I think in this case, I'm just gonna reap with Schuler. I might as well increase my amber in case Justin has a way to stop a, a few points of my amber. Um, I'm gonna go to eight amber. I will end my turn by untapping my guys. I have three cards in hand. I will draw three, um, putting me to uh, six, and I will say check with eight amber. It is now Justin's turn. All right, so discarding the Sergeant Zekiel was a huge bummer. I, I'm going to call Sanctum this turn, but I'll show you Sergeant Zekiel anyway. And how sad he is in my discard pile. On play, he says you may ready and fight with neighboring creatures. So after playing him, I get an immediate opportunity to fight with something. I really wanted that this turn because I wanted to be able to kill Tret. <laughs> now I can't. But I'm going to play Sanctum. I will play Shield of Justice which is not actually going to do anything interesting this turn. It says, for the remainder of the turn, each friendly creature can't be dealt damage. Would have been pretty sweet if I was able to fight with something, but I can't. And I'll play Staunch Knight. Staunch Knight gets plus two power while on a flank. So he's six power, two armor on a flank. Pretty beefy. Not easy to take off the table. However, that's all I got. I'm not gonna, I could use this Hallow Blaster to heal three from a creature. None of my creatures are damaged. I don't want to heal a Shuler, so... I just passed the turn. Dodge Knight readies. I have four cards. I draw two. Okay. So I've got eight amber. I get to count off six of it and forge my second key. Okay. Um, I think uh, I could... Um, I could do it. I could take a number of actions this turn. I think Shadows is the most straightforward though. Um, so I am gonna play Silvertooth, who is a two power elf thief that enters play ready. So uh, as soon as I play Silvertooth, he's just ready. I am going to play another copy of Urchin to steal one from Justin. And then I am going to play Bad Penny. Um, Bad Penny is a one power human thief that says destroyed, return Bad Penny to your hand. Um, so I am going to play Bad Penny 
and I'm going to use Seeker Needle to shoot my own bad penny, deal one damage to her. She's destroyed, she goes back to my hand, and that creature was destroyed, so I will gain an amber. Now, I could choose to play bad penny again, um, but in this case, um, I'm actually going to choose to discard bad penny. You have the option of whenever you take a turn to discard any cards of the house that you have chosen. The reason I'm discarding bad penny here is because I think it is unlikely that I'm going to say shadows on the next turn and bad penny dies a lot and gets returned to your hand a lot and she sits in your hand and will often gunk it up. Strategically, one of the best things you can do in Keyforge is typically to get through your deck as fast as you can so you get to play your best cards over and over again. Bad Penny by herself is not very good. However, when you combine her with cards like Seeker Needle, various other cards in the game, that's when she really starts to shine. Um, but I don't think I'll get another chance to use Bad Penny in this game, so I'm actually going to discard her so I can draw more cards for my turn. Um, Silvertooth here is going to reap I could fight with him, but uh, he's not going to really accomplish much there. Um, that's going to get me one point away from winning the game. So uh, I will be finished there, and I will draw three up to six. All right. I'm going to take a look at his turn. Uh, I'm glad that Nathan did not check there because I probably would have just lost the game. <laughs> but I am about to do one of the most fun things one can do in a card game, and that's to draw a bunch of cards. So I'm going to start my turn off by playing Library Access. The remainder of the turn, each time you play another card, draw a card. So every time I play something, I'm going to draw a card. Pretty cool. Um, I, I, I will say that there's an asterisk on library access, but for an introductory game, we're going to skip over the asterisk. Yeah, yeah. Library Babble, I'm going to go ahead and use this action to exhaust it to draw a card. And then I'm going to start playing stuff. So... I'll play Dimension Door. So throughout thro the remainder of the turn, any amber you would gain from reaping is stolen from your opponent instead. I'm not going to be able to reap this turn because I don't have any ready Logos creatures, but it'll draw me a card. Okay. I'll play a Bat Drone. Two power creature. It's got Skirmish. And it's blurry. And it fights to steal one. So after it fights and lives, it steals an amber. So pretty good if I can actually activate it. And the draw a card. All right. And then I'll play Dr. Escotero, who got shuffled into the deck earlier. I'll draw a card for playing it. And I gain an amber for each forge key my opponent has. And that's two forge keys. Strategically, shuffle the back on yep. my deck. I'm going to play Doc Bookton. He's a five power creature. It has reap draw card. So after she reaps, I get to draw a card. Pretty solid. And I get to draw a card for playing her. All right, I will shift my battle line a little bit so I can play more cards in that flank. Play another bat drum, draw a card. Play a mother, which is one of the best creatures in the game in my opinion. Says during your turn, draw a card step, you fill your hand to one additional card. So while she's in play, my hand size is seven. Pretty, pretty great. Five power, kind of hard to kill. She'll go there, I draw a card. And then, <laughs> Thanks for that sub. Kelly's unique and Ultra Gecko. I saw you sub as well. Appreciate it. I'm going to play a Wild Wormhole. That's going to give me an Amber. It's going to draw me a card for playing card. And then I'm going to play the top card of my library for, or my, de my deck uh, with the Wild Wormhole to play a Regrowth. Regrowth gets me an Amber. I get to look through my discard pile and return a creature from my discard pile to my hand. You draw a card for playing. Draw a card for playing it first. So I will grab you the adventurer. Put it back in my hand. Show you regrowth real quick. Very solid card. It's useful in a lot of different situations. That goes to my discard pile. It's very good to get Dust Pixies back. With. Yeah. And then I'll play Key of the Adventure on this flank and draw another card. Now, I am out of cards to play. I played a lot of Logos cards that turn, as well as one non-Logos card. I have eight cards in my hand. I pass the turn, I ready all my cards. During my draw card step, I will refill my hand to one additional card. However, I have eight cards in my hand. I don't have to discard down, but I also don't draw any cards. 
Um, if I were to draw cards from my deck right now, I would reshuffle my discard pile into my deck. However, since I'm not drawing any cards, my discard pile just sits there, waiting to be redrawn. So I pass turn, I have to check with seven. Okay. All right. So um, I can't actually stop Justin from forging this key. So I think the best thing that I can do is try to uh, make it so that I have set myself up to win the game and um, and try to stop Justin from letting me uh, uh, give Justin no other way to, to, to stop me. I, I want to take these bat drones off the table because they can both steal amber. So I want to stop that. I am going to say Brobnar. I'm going to play Blood of the Titans, which is a, an attachment. It gives me an amber for playing it. So that gets me to six right there. And um, it gives a creature plus five power. So I am going to put this on Silvertooth. I am going to play a Brobnar creature called Ganger Chieftain. It has a play effect of you may ready and fight with a neighboring creature. This is very similar to Sergeant Zekiel. So I'm going to play Ganger Chieftain next to Silvertooth here. This is going to let Silvertooth fight a creature. Um, so uh, one of the, another important concept in Keyforge is do as much of the card as you can. So even though Silvertooth was not exhausted, I can still use Ganger Chieftain's effect to ready and fight with Silvertooth. I don't get to ready Silvertooth because he was already ready, um, but now I can still fight with him. So Silvertooth is going to fight this Bat Drone. All right. And then I'm going to play another Ganger Chieftain who's going to let me ready and fight with this Ganger Chieftain. And this Ganger Chieftain is going to fight the other Bat Drone. Um, I have to beat up these pesky robots who are trying to stop me from winning. Now, I am going to use the Gauntlet of Command to ready and fight with a friendly creature. Um, I could choose any of my creatures. I could choose Charette if I wanted to. I'm not going to put any damage on Charette to make it easier for just to kill Charette. Um, I think I just choose this Ganger Chieftain and um, I have this Ganger Chieftain fight Keo. Um, to stop Justin from drawing any cards during a Logos turn he may take, or at least try to stop him from drawing more Logos cards. Um, and that's it. I'm at six right now. I'll say check with six. Um, ready up my creatures and draw three. Okay, so start of my turn. I have seven Amber, so I spend six and I forge. Uh, I will say House Sanctum for my turn. Since I have a way to stop Nathan from forging. Uh, Staunch Knight is going to fight that Charette. All right. I really, really don't like that Charette being alive. It's four power. She's four power. Well, it's actually six power right now. Um, so it takes two damage because two damage was reduced by its armor. I get that amber that it captured back directly to my pool. I will play a Raiding Knight. So on play, it captures one. I'll show you a rating knight. 4-2 creature, captures one. <clears throat> it's just a beefy. Take one from Nathan's pool, add to the creature. Play another rating knight. Take one, add to the creature. I'll play a Lady Maxna. No, no, no. no. Launched it. Play, stun a creature. Very similar to the Rob Nargai that Nathan played earlier, except she also has an action where she can return herself to my hand if I want, and like if a pinch in a pinch I get stun another creature. And she's got two armor, so she's pretty beefy. Then I will play Terms of Redress. I get an amber for playing it. It says choose a friendly creature to capture two. So I would take two amber from Nathan's pool. I put it on a creature. I'll put it on my beefiest creature currently, which is Lady Maxina. Then, I'm going to play a Cleansing Wave. So, heal the damage from each creature, gain one for each creature healed this way. So I'll heal one from Staunch Knight, one from Schuler, one from Silvertooth, 
one from Ganger Chieftain, and Storm. one from Ganger Chieftain. That was one, two, three, four, five creatures that were healed. I gained five amber for that. So one, two, three, four, five. End of my turn. I ready my guys. I have three cards in my hand, so I will draw three cards. I have to shuffle my discard pile, and then I'll draw three cards from my discard pile. And I say check with 10 amber, which is probably going to be pretty difficult for Nathan to deal with. Okay. So, I am going to say shadows. I am going to start my turn by playing a card called Too Much to Protect. Um, this card gives me amber. And it says, steal all but six of your opponent's amber. Um, so, I, I actually get to take four amber from Justin. I put him back down to six, and I take this four. Uh, it's all now mine. <laughs> Um, I can play a Shadow Self. We've seen Shadow Self before. I can play another copy of Naughty the Thief. We've seen Naughty the Thief before. Um, I can use Silvertooth here. Silvertooth is seven power because of the blood of the Titans. So Silvertooth is actually going to fight Lady Maxna. Um, Silvertooth will take five damage. Um, and Silvertooth will liberate my Amber from uh, Justin's grasp. I've got an Urchin. Urchin can't really fight anybody effectively there, so I'm going to reap with Urchin to go to 10. I'm going to use Seeker Needle to do one damage to my Urchin. Sorry, kid. It's not personal. I need this Amber. I will shoot Urchin um, and gain an Amber. Um, however, I don't have any way to stop Justin from getting check uh, from, from uh, forging a key at the start of his turn. I have got three discards in my hand that don't stop it. Um, that's it. So, uh, it goes to Justin's turn. I ready up. I draw my cards. Um, but Justin is going to win the game. Yep. So I forged my third key. However, you can see the game was very close. Nathan yep. has eleven I, amber at the I, end of his turn. I think Justin would be hard pressed to stop me if I could have stopped him there. Yep. Um, so yeah, that is Keyforge. There we go. Uh, we did not script the starter game, but I think that was a pretty good one as far as just learning all of the different mechanics yeah, um, to the game. So, And you can see how the game ends up being close, and it was kind of hard to predict who was going to win that game um, from turn to turn. Uh, it, was, it was different. I think you could have predicted a different winner on each turn of that game. They're yeah. all very big and swinging toward the end there. So yeah, um, that's Keyforge. Any questions? Go. Okay, great. No questions. <laughs> uh, we uh, we're gonna play. I, I think maybe just one more game tonight. We might revisit this on Sunday. Yeah, we might do the advanced game because uh, that game took a little bit longer than yeah. we expected, and because we're gonna have to show off so many cards, this second game may go a little bit long as well. Um, so that's that. Was that thing? The thing happened. I, I put. I hit a button. 